Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ken Murray. Tonight, we have a very unusual show for you. In the next 60 minutes, you're going to see the greatest all-star cast ever assembled on any television show. Over 60 movie stars. But before we start, let me make this clear. These are not old movie clips. There's not one shot out of an old feature motion picture. These films are all brand new in the sense that they've never been shown before. Of course, when I started taking these pictures over 30 years ago, there were very few actors interested in amateur movies. But today, as you will see, I have much more competition. You know, in Hollywood, there is often more doing in the hours away from the camera than during the working day in front of it. And though these after-hour doings are mostly frivolous, glimpses like this of stars without scripts, capsule accounts of film personalities, can often be more revealing about a community than a stack of tomes written on the subject. This film was taken by an amateur photographer. If you think that hat is funny, you should have seen the one I had on when I arrived in Hollywood in 1927. Before we get underway, I must tell you how I started this collection. I came out west in 1927. It was my first time away from home, and naturally I wanted to send back some mementos to the folks. But instead of sending snapshots and postcards, I bought one of these newfangled 16 millimeter home movie cameras. I also bought a projector, but I left the projector at home, and from time to time, I would send back film of the trip. When I arrived in Hollywood, naturally I wanted to get as many pictures of movie stars uh, that I could so that I'd be a big man back in Kingston, New York. And as I look back now, I'm kind of embarrassed what a nuisance I was trying to make movie stars pose for me. I, I, I used to stop people on the street if they even looked like a movie star. And you know, you'd be surprised how many people looked like Fatty Arbuckle in 1927. But anyway, here are the pictures I sent back home. Los Angeles, 1927. This daring shot was taken from the top of the Orpheum Theater where I was playing. That's 8th and Broadway down there. This was taken in front of the Orpheum Theater. Recognize those cars? You should. You see them every week in The Untouchables. I had to send home a picture of my billing on a theater marquee. Of course, I wasn't the headliner, but at least they spell my name right. If you think the traffic is bad on the freeway today, you should have tried to get across downtown Broadway in 1927. Portrait of an early American jaywalker. I wore funny hats on the stage, too. Here I am at the backstage door borrowing money from the manager. The headliner from the week before was down the alley heckling me, Jimmy Durante with Sid Gorman. The youngest member of our troupe was 15 years old. That's Ricky Nelson's mother, Harriet Hilliard. 
here's a young fellow who hadn't made a movie yet. When this picture was taken, he was a master of ceremonies in a picture house, Dick Powell. Ralph Bellamy was just starting out on a long and brilliant career. Here's a guy you watched week after week on Dragnet. And if you want the facts, ma'am, it's Ben Alexander. This is the first movie star I ever saw in person, Lou Cody. He was a big star in silent pictures. I stopped him on the street and gave my camera to a woman passing by and asked her to take this picture. You can see she was no James Wong Howe. The day after I closed at the Orpheum, I went out and played golf. These pictures were taken by a friend of mine who was a newsreel cameraman. In the middle of the game, I suddenly remembered that I had made an appointment in Hollywood to go through a studio in one of those big tourist buses. Boulevard in 1927. But I made it in time, and with the rest of the tourists, here we go through the Paramount Gate. There's Will Rogers. That's Charles Bickford. All the stars were nice to us autograph hounds. That's Carol Lombard. Jack Oakey, a swell guy who later became a lifelong friend. This is the first movie star who ever invited me into his home, Richard Arlen. And this is the first Hollywood swimming pool I ever saw. Dick was the hottest star at Paramount at this moment. He had just made Wings, which was to win an Academy Award. I had to get a picture in that pool to send back home, so Dick took over on camera. You can see I was no Weissmuller. Lou Ayers. This was taken a couple of years before he made All Quiet on the Western Front. At this time, he was making a picture with Greta Garbo called The Kiss. It was the last silent picture made at MGM. This was the week that Groman's Chinese Theater opened. As a matter of fact, this is the day it opened, in May 1927. The picture was King of Kings. The people started gathering early in the afternoon. By nightfall, it was a madhouse. That's the beautiful Dolores Costello. The crowd really went crazy when Gene Harlow walked in. Such pushing and shoving, they knocked over lamps. Gary Cooper took it in stride. And so did Gloria Swanson. And there's Janet Gaynor and Charles Farrell. This was the year she won the first Academy Award for her performance in Seventh Heaven. The next day, I went down to the Warner Brothers studio on Sunset Boulevard. It afterward became a bowling alley, and I believe is now a television station. I was lucky to get inside, but it was very difficult to get any great shots on account of the lights and the quality of the film at that time. There's Monty Blue working with a young lady named Myrna Loy. And there's Tom Mix doing a scene with a very pretty young lady, Sally Blaine. She's Loretta Young's sister. John Barrymore and Dolores Costello. I didn't shoot this, it was taken by the cameraman and I got a copy later. But you'll see that it was done as a gag as it has a comedy finish. This is the way they worked in silent pictures. Off screen mood music and the director talking to the actors as the scene is being shot. All right, John, kiss her. 
Okay, cut. Cut! Mr. Barrymore, it's time for lunch. Outside the studio, I got another shot of the very handsome Mr. Barrymore. Then I went up to the Chaplin Studios on Sunset and La Brea. Chaplin and Fairbanks had come backstage at the Orpheum Theater on opening night, and I asked them if it was possible to visit their studio. Chaplin told me to come out this particular morning that he was entertaining a British military dignitary, and there would be a lot of cameramen there, and I would be welcome to take some pictures. his brother Sidney back there. This guy Charlie sure took some funny falls. I tried to ride one of those things myself once, but I assure you it wasn't quite so humorous. Sidney could ride it. As a matter of fact, I'm sure Charlie could have if he'd wanted to. Sidney Chaplin was quite a comedian himself. Pick fair. The first time I ever saw Mary Pickford. America's sweetheart. The biggest movie star the world has ever known. She had just received a present from some fan and very graciously consented to pose for a picture. Doug Fairbank Sr. I don't know how I ever kept the camera steady enough to take a picture of my boyhood idol. I asked him if he would do one of those leaps off a balcony, and he did. This was my first trip to Hollywood, and I said, man, this is it. Horace Greeley was right. Notice the Fairbanks influence. There's the train coming to take us back east. I stood on the rear platform of that train, watching the golden sun sink into the blue Pacific. I murmured those famous words, I shall return. Two years passed before I got back to the coast again, and in that short time there were a great many changes in Hollywood. For one thing, the talkies had come in. As a matter of fact, that's why I went back. I was signed for one of the first talkies on the RKO lot. Modes of transportation were starting to change in America, too. Where I had come back east by train, I now rushed back to the coast by air. Yes, I took my first plane ride in 1929 in a plane that looked something like this, in a tri-motor plane. This was the fastest thing in the air at that time, going almost uh, 100 miles an hour. Edgar Bergen was on the same plane. Now, I don't know whether you folks who travel in jets today realize what it entailed across the country by air in 1929. For one thing, there was no night flying. We are, all the passengers met at Pennsylvania Station, and we took an overnight train to Columbus, Ohio. We got off the train, took a bus to the airport, boarded a plane, and flew to Wayno, Oklahoma. Then we got off the plane, and we took an overnight train to Clovis, New Mexico. And then we continued by air from Clovis, New Mexico to Los Angeles. By rail, air, and bus, we crossed the continent in the record-breaking time of 48 hours. Here's the plane. I wasn't nervous. I was hysterical. Lindbergh had only flown the ocean two years before. There's Edgar Bergen trying to be nonchalant.
the thing that bothered me was that we kept flying over water. What happens if we have to land? And just about this time, the pilot announced that we were running into some kind of a tornado and would have to change our course and go way up north. But I did get a chance to get a rather unusual picture. Mount Rushmore before it was completed. Finally, we got over the lush fields of California and started to land at Burbank. When we got to the airport, it was just swarming with newsreel cameramen and photographers. I thought Edgar and I had really arrived, but it wasn't for us. It was for some pilot who was coming in to change planes. He was getting off of his and getting on ours. I got a shot of his plane coming in. There he is, Charles Lindbergh. downtown in L.A., there was a big parade going on. But it wasn't for us or it wasn't for Lindbergh. It was for two fellows called Amos and Andy. They had come to Hollywood to film their first picture, Check and Double Check, and at this moment were making their first personal appearance at a local theater. They broke every existing box office record. Here are the usherettes congratulating Freeman Gosden and Charlie Carell on their phenomenal engagement.